Okay, guys. Well, good morning and welcome to the second workshop. Um, as always, I would like to begin by telling you what we're going to be doing today. So today is January 17th. It's, it's a beautiful Sunday. And 2021. Oh, there you go. There you go. 2021. Thank you. I still haven't gotten used to it. Uh, let's see. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at two topics. Okay. The first one is skills and their sub skills. And how to help our students develop each one effectively, okay? By, this, by the skills, I mean the four skills, like reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And you probably all know that each skill has different types of sub skills, like little areas specifically for that skill. And that's going to be the, the first topic. We're probably gonna spend like, like most of the class on that one. And we're also going to talk about different approaches, different approaches, and which one to use in our classes. So there are many different approaches to teaching a language. Um, I think today I'm gonna teach you about like eight or nine of them. I'm gonna tell you which one are, is the most common one and which ones teachers nowadays use the most. Okay, because in, in the past, a lot of teachers used to use the grammar translation approach. They would translate everything. And that's how students will learn and it worked. But research shows that that's not the best way to learn English. And of course, um, these are not just ideas that I come up with. These are ideas that research has been done on. They are in the Cambridge um, teaching books. So, Yes, this is legit stuff. Okay. Now, I sent teacher Angelica some images and I believe she has sent them to you about uh, reading, reflection, writing, reflection, and speaking, reflection, listening, reflection, and approach reflection. Uh, we are going to be using those throughout the class I'm going to put you in groups or pairs, and you're going to be discussing those reflections. Um, those reflections are going to help us to, you know, think about what we do in our classes and help help us get different ideas from our teachers. Okay. <clears throat> so let us begin. Can everybody see this? Yes, okay. This is the four skills, their sub skills, and how to develop, how to help our students develop them effectively. All right, let me see. Let's see. Jocelyn, could you please read this slide for us? I'll try. Maybe. Uh, reading is a receptive skill. That means it involves responding to text instead of producing it. To put it simply, we can say that reading involves making sense of text. 
to make sense of text, we need to understand the language of the text at word level, sentence level, or whole text level. We also need to connect the message of the text to our knowledge of the world. All right, this is pretty simple to understand, right? We need to understand text at word level, sentence level, and whole text level. And then we need to be able to connect that message to our knowledge about the world. Um, so, you know, when we teach our students, you know, first we teach them words like colors, red, blue, green. We teach them numbers, one, two, three. And then we start teaching them like verbs and subjects. And then they can start making sentences. I'm a boy, she's a girl. And then they can learn, after they learn how to make sentences, they can learn how to make paragraphs or whole text. All right. And writers do that too. And when we consume that, we need to be able to connect it to the real world. Ingrid, could you read this, please? Mm, there was. Okay. The boy, the boy was surprised because the girl was much faster at running than he was. To understand the sentence, we need to understand what the letters are, how letters join together to make words, what the words mean and the grammar of the words and the sentence. But we also make sense of this sentence by knowing that Generally speaking, girls, sorry, girls don't, girls do not run faster than boys. Our knowledge of the word helps us understand why the boy was surprised. Yes. <clears throat> now, we know, we understand the sentence because, you know, we can speak English well, read English well, and we understand why the boy would be surprised in this situation, but maybe a, a baby wouldn't really, the baby would understand a sentence, but they wouldn't know why the boy was surprised because maybe they don't know that usually boys run faster than girls, but us, we have that knowledge so we can understand this sentence. We know why the boy was surprised, all right? Well, wow. here comes a good part. Mr. Juan, could you read this, please? Okay, reading. Reading has nine sub skills. The four most common ones are scanning, reading for specific information, skimming, reading for east main idea, Extensive reading, reading for enjoyment and developing generally reading skills. Intensive reading, reading in details for specific aims and tasks. Okay, guys. So you guys told me that your students have exams this week. Okay. Now, you guys prepare your exams. But do you have any students who you think one day would be interested in taking a Cambridge or a TOEFL exam? Yeah. The, the most important skills for those type of proficiency tests are the first two, scanning and skimming. You know, if, if you take one of those tests, a TOEFL test, a Cambridge test, and you read the entire article and then read the questions and then read the article again, you're not going to have enough time. And that's where these two skills come in. See, scanning is reading for specific information. These are the type of questions that will ask you something like this. What does the word dandy mean on line four? And what you do is you look for that word in line four. You're looking for that specific information and you're looking for the things around it to help you understand it, okay? And 
for skimming. Skimming is for questions that will ask you about the main idea. What does, sorry, what's the article's main topic? Who we'll asks you questions like that? Or what is the purpose of the author's, of the author writing this? Okay, now these skills are important because I, as I said earlier, if you read an entire article and answer the questions, you're not gonna have enough time. You're not gonna finish. And if you don't finish, then it's gonna affect you a lot in your, in your final score. So being able to master scanning and skimming can help you finish quicker. And at the end of the day, you don't really need to read the entire article to answer those questions. You just need to be able to find specific answers and understand the general idea. And um, for us, what we can do for our students for scanning is, well, they can find specific words and find the definition of those words, right? But for skimming, this is what we can tell our students. Tell them to read the first sentence of each paragraph, okay? So if you're going to give them an article and that article has like four or five sentences, usually the first sentence of each paragraph has the general idea of that article. Okay, it, it never fails. That is like the writing style or that is the like perfect, how can I say, content or text style. All good writers put the main idea at the beginning of the paragraph, okay? To give you like a brief understanding of what the paragraph is going to be about. So, you know, tell your students, read the first sentence of each paragraph and don't give them a lot of time. Tell them you have 30 seconds. Okay. Time them, time them. Um, you guys, do you only teach beginners or do you also teach like intermediate and advanced students? In elementary school, there's only one level, but I don't know, from starting from fifth grade to elementary school and middle school and high school it's divided we have a beginners intermediate and advanced level okay who here is the elementary school teacher me mr juan andres yeah okay okay only you no they are and teacher media i guess me too Lydia. yes Jocelyn, Nidia, um, um, Angie. Okay, okay. And tell me, M Mr. Guerrero, do you read articles with your students or not really? Yes, I read some articles with my students. For example, um, last week we read something about the Egyptian culture. And I read with them and they, uh, they follow me in, in the books or copies they have. Then we analyze some some words that they may maybe they don't know. Okay, okay, nice, nice. And uh, you should, uh, so it's it's great. You have the opportunity to help your students with this skill, right? Now for this for this skill you can also look at the title you can look at pictures and you can get the general idea, right? Yeah. But you, you don't want to get your students used to that because on those proficiency tests, there's not gonna be any pictures. Maybe there's gonna be a title, maybe, but there's not gonna be any pictures, you know? So, you know, cover the title and pictures. 
or you know tell your students to cover the title and the pictures um you know you have to follow good good sequence so let me put this in order for you okay you cover the title and the pictures you tell your students okay class you're gonna have 30 minutes you need to tell me the general idea of this article whatever article you give to them and they're like 30 seconds what teacher what and you're gonna be like yes but don't worry the only thing you need to do is read the sentence the first sentence of each paragraph and make a connection and you as a teacher you can maybe write four answers on the board like is it A, is it B, is it C, or is it D? And they have, they're gonna have 30 seconds. And then you can make, at, at the end of the 30 seconds, you can make your students raise their hand if you think it's letter A. Raise your hand if you think it's letter B. Raise your hand if you think letter C. And this will help your students develop that skill for skimming, okay? Because that's one of the most important ones. And you can tell your students that they use this skill in real life all the time, okay? Maybe you guys use this skill too whenever you go to the supermarket. Whenever you go to the supermarket and you're you know, waiting to pay for your, for your groceries, you see an interesting picture in the magazine you open the magazine and you want to know what the picture is about. Okay, you're finding the, the general idea. Or maybe you also practice your scanning. Okay, again, you see something interesting. Maybe an earthquake in Japan destroys many homes. And you want to know how many people died in the earthquake because you're chismoso. Oh, yes, I need to know how many people died so I can tell my family, my friends. No, my just Quantas veces se murieron en, en Japón? You know, you know, you're looking for that specific information. Okay, so we use these skills a lot in real life, um, but they are very important skills on those tests. Okay, you should focus on those a lot in your class. Now, extensive reading is you know w when you read for pleasure because you want to read because you like reading. Um, do any of you here read extensively? Or nah, we don't, we don't do that. Teacher, teacher Jocelyn? Like that, like Facebook uh, news or something? Facebook okay. or that's, something? <laughs> that's, yes, that's something modern, yes. Okay. Well, I guess everybody reads extensively if they're going to read statuses, articles, okay, okay. And intensive reading. Intensive reading is when you, usually this is done in the classroom. Your students read for a reason. Like we're going to read this article to find out new vocabulary about science. Or we're going to read this article to learn the present perfect. That is intensive reading. You're reading for a specific reason, okay? Remember, aims is the goals. The goals are what you set at the beginning of the class, the objectives. Okay? Let's move on. Do you have any questions, guys? No? All right. Tokayo, could you read this, please? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, reading. The other five reading sub skills are predicting, using clues before we begin reading to guess what the text will be about. Two, reading for detail, getting the meaning out of every word and out of links, relationships between words and sentences, sometimes referred to as intensive reading. Number three, the deducing meaning from text, working out the meaning of words using the, the other words around it or thinking about the context. Four, understanding text structure, understanding how system types of text generally develop, 
And uh, finally, number five, inferring, working out the, the writer's opinion on a topic or what the feelings is on it. Okay, very good. So in total, there are nine sub skills. Scanning, skimming, extensive reading, intensive reading, and these. Predicting, reading for detail, deducing meaningful context, and understanding text structure and inferring. Now, it is important that you know these. It is very important that you know these. And the reason why it's important is because you should work on a specific one at a specific time, you know, or try to do all of them. Like, you can't try to do all of them in one class, unless you have a lot of time, of course. But you should know, you should always work in each area. It will help your students become great readers. Can I continue to the next slide? Okay. Well, let's see, there goes the reading reflection. Let's talk about this a little bit. Um, raise your hand if you have your students read articles and stuff like that out loud in class. Yes, your students read out loud in class. Ingrid, no? Andres, no? No, I'm teaching kindergarten. Okay, so they don't read out loud in class. Okay. <laughs> when, when they read out loud in class, is that a reading skill? or a speaking skill? A little bit of both, no? More like a speaking. Yeah, because sometimes they, they read out loud, but they don't uh, really concentrate on what they are reading. I love that you said that. At first, it is a little bit of both, but it is mostly speaking because that's what they're worried about. They have all that pressure. They don't want to make a mistake. And I love that you said that they don't really understand it. Okay, I love that. See, I, I think, you know, we have this tendency of making our students read all the time. Remember, sometimes it's a good idea to read texts for your students and have them focus only on understanding the text. Now, this is like, whoa, what? Because our teachers always made us read, right? But the thing is that we were learning our first language. So it's like, you know, we need to be able to speak. But in this case, it depends on what skill you are working on. If you want to help your students with the reading skills, maybe you can read for them, you know, and they can follow along with their fingers. And in, in this way, they're not so focused on pronunciation that they can actually concentrate more on understanding the text, okay? So depending on what skill you want to work on, if you want to help your students with the pronunciation, then yes, tell them to read out loud. Okay, but if you want to help your students with their comprehension skills, understanding, then maybe you can read it for them. Okay, or maybe you can have the advanced student read, the one who's really good at reading, you, you can have him read it for the class. Okay. So yes, yeah, you know, sometimes it's a good idea for you to read the text for your students. Sometimes don't even read the entire article at all, okay? Um, how much time do you have in your classes? 50 minutes, one hour, one hour, 10 minutes, one hour, 50 minutes. That's nothing, right? It's really difficult to give a good class with 50 minutes. 
It's very difficult. Now, with with 50 minutes, uh, I I wouldn't read the entire t the entire article. Like I would not read it for my students, or my students would not read it either. Because I would prefer to use that time to develop sub skills. Instead, use that time to develop sub skills. Okay. Um, so something that you know we can do for reading is first, you know, teach or pre-teach unknown vocabulary. You know, that's one of the first things you should do. Of course, pre-teach unknown vocabulary. And maybe you can first, you know, build interest. And you can switch those two steps around. First, you can build interest and then teach vocabulary. Or first, you can teach vocabulary and then build interest. It depends on students. It depends on your style. But building interest means like if we're going to read an article about the biggest cities in the world, maybe we can ask our students, guys, what do you think the biggest cities in the world are? How many people do you think live there? Would you like to visit these cities? You know, you're building interests. Um, after you build interests, you know, maybe they can predict. They can predict something. What do you think the article is going to talk about? What words do you think are going to come in the article? We know we're going to be talking about cities. What words do you think are going to be in there? Population. Mm -hmm people, okay, pollution, maybe. They can predict and maybe you can tell them to skim. All right, guys, you have 30 seconds. Find the general idea of this article. Is the writer trying to educate or entertain? Okay. Then you can tell them to scan. All right, guys, I want you to find this word for me. The first person to find this word gets an extra point and they find the word. Oh, they're looking for the word. Boom. And then at the end, if you have time, then you can read the entire text, okay? If you have time, then you can read the entire text. But you should practice, you know, these skills so they can develop them because they will help them a lot. On real tests, they will help them a lot, okay? It's optional. A, a lot of times, like me, 50-50, I don't even read the articles. Um, unless they are beginners, like if they are beginners, then yes, it's a good idea to read the text so they can, you know, learn how to pronounce better. But when they are reading, don't interrupt them. Okay, don't interrupt them. Let, let them finish reading. And, you know, you, you take notes of their mistake. And once they finish reading, you can correct them. And if you want, you can tell them to read it again, but this time with the correct pronunciation. Okay. And of course, you can change these skills. You don't, you don't necessarily always have to predict, skim, scan, predict, skim. No, you can change it. You can deduce meaning. You can infer, okay? What is the author's feeling of this text? You can change the skills. You don't always have to work on those. Have a variety. And you as a teacher, you can find out what the interests of your students are and help them find things that they would enjoy reading outside of the class, okay? Like if your students really like politics, maybe you can find a book about politics that's easy, you know, something for children and give it to them, okay? If they are beginners, it's not a good idea to read adult books because adult books have big vocabulary words, 
But if you give them a children's book, you know, children's book are nice. They have small words and they will understand it a little bit better. If your student likes cars, find them a car book. Hey, this is car book on Amazon. It costs 150 pesos. Why don't, why don't you buy it, man? If they have money, of course. Or you can find the pirated version on the internet and give it to them. Okay. Do you guys have any tips about reading? Any tips you could share with the class? Come on, Miss Delgado. I know you have a lot of tips. Tocayo, what's up? Share, share, share your knowledge with us, Mr. Guerrero, Ms. Pelais. Maybe give a list of uh, vocabulary. Yes, yes. When do you do that? I I I don't do that because my my students don't don't read that. Ah, okay, okay. But I think that is a good idea to give to the students um, a list of vocabulary um, before to read a text. I don't know. Yes, definitely, definitely. I agree. Uh, one activity I apply is to give the students um, a text to order it, the paragraphs or, or the text aren't in, in, in order and they have to have to work in themes in order to order the, the text, the parts of the text, the introduction, um, and the develop of, of, the, of the text and the end in the case. Uh, of the story. Yes, that's really good, man. That's a really good skill. That that activity right there is for understanding text structure. You know, understand how they develop. You know, you have your opening paragraph, your body paragraphs. That's a really good one. I like that. I also use that one in my classes. It's good. All right. And uh, well, as you see, I have pre-teach unknown vocabulary first. Um, Remember, you don't always have to pre-teach vocabulary. You know, you can make your students figure out the meaning by, you know, using context. And that's another sub-skill. It all depends how, how you want to do it. Um, you know, I recommend you always have variety. Don't, don't let your students get used to a certain type. You know, change, you know, one skill every time or two skills every time. Okay? And that is it for... Reading. Now, can you please open your cell phones and get this image out, please? The one that says reading reflection. You got it? Okay. So, reading reflection. We're going to take some time, you know, to reflect on these teachers' comments, and it's going to help us reflect on our teaching styles and our beliefs and our ideas, okay? Let's do this together. Think about these comments from teachers. Which do you agree with and why? Number one, I think reading for detail is the most important reading skill. I think reading for detail is the most important reading skill. What do you think, guys? Do you think it's the most important reading skill? There should be another L there, sorry. Remember, there's no wrong answer. This is just I, think, like, I don't agree with that because uh, we don't always need, need to read to find just detail in a text. 
sometimes we need to extract um, more information and we need to use um, some other strategies that can help us to identify the information we need. And if we just apply detail or if we consider detail is the most important, we are, we, we wouldn't be using other, other good strategies. Nice, very good, very well worded. Uh, do you have, or do you think there's an, a specific skill that is the most important, Mr. Melgar? Excuse me? Do you think that there is a specific skill that is the most important? Um, like maybe scanning? No? Um, well, I consider all of them are important. They, nice. have, they, they have their own appropriate use, corresponding use. Um, we need to know when I apply each one of them. Oh, nice. I like that. I like that. Does anybody else have a comment on this comment? Can I say something? Go, of course, of course. Um, well, like uh, Teacher Melgar uh, said, I think all of the skills are important, but uh, like you previously mentioned, uh, when you're applying an exam, the most useful uh, skills are uh, scanning and uh, skimming. Okay, yes. um, all of them are important, of course. But if you will have a specific objective, okay, which is uh, a preparing your students for. Cambridge exam, then you need to develop a scanning and scheming a little bit, or you need to focus on them a little bit more. Because uh, most of the readings uh, and all of most of the activities uh, ha are about scheming and scanning. Yes. Okay, okay. So it depends on the goal, right? The objective. I like that. I like that. Mr. Andres, could you read the second one, please? Uh, yes, uh, uh, my, my learners like me to read them stories, even if they don't understand everything. Is this the case for any of you? No, they, you don't, they don't like for you to read stories. You don't read stories. <laughs> I have uh, audio books. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, the book, uh, the digital book has like the audio. Wow, that's, that's it's for kids. Yeah, better. and it has like the like the sound. Like someone knocked the door and they're like, so it's like uh, it's an audio book. That's cool. And I don't need to to read. Luckily. <laughs> all right, all right. That's cool. Is that the same for you, Juan, Fernando, and Ingrid? You have audio books? Yeah. No, I don't, I don't have, I don't use them. I usually, uh, sometimes I read for, for my students. Okay, okay, nice. And, and, and they enjoy it, even though they don't understand everything? Uh, yes, and in the end of the, of the reading, they, ask me the, the questions they have about some words they, they don't get. Nice. They don't recognize. Very good, very good. And Ms. Delgado, do you read to your students in elementary? Mm, sometimes I'm teaching kindergarten. Um, my book have a story songs. Oh, nice, nice. They like, I think that they like. Um, but they don't read that. Okay, I see. That's understandable. Thank you. And Jocelyn, could you read number three, please? 
some of my learners try to understand what the whole text is about. Is that true for any of you? Yes, yes, it is very true. Yes, and do you have any students who don't try to understand what the whole text is about? Yes, some of my students only focus on the activities okay, uh, of the book. And the, most of my students, some of my students, sorry, some of my students concentrate on the book's activities and, and that's it. They don't care about the whole text. Do you think that's good for them? Well, uh, uh, it depends. It depends. It depends. Uh, I mean, they are they're doing what the book says at the end of the day. But I mean, it could be bad because they're not developing uh, more skills. But when when you're applying an exam, I mean, I do that. I don't read the whole text. I just do what the, te the text says. Nice, nice. I like that. I like that. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Hello, Mr. Morales. Welcome to the class. Hello. Good evening. I'm here Hi. finally. Very good. Very good. All right. Well, you're right on time. We're going to start this other skill. All right. So we talked about um, reading. Now let's get on to the writing. So writing is a productive skill. That means it involves producing language rather than receiving it. Very simply, you can say that writing involves communicating a message by making signs on something. And those signs are, in our case, letters, right? Words. And words, yes, yes. To write, we need to have something to communicate and usually someone to communicate to. We also need to be able to form letters and words and join these together to make sentences or a series of sentences that link together and to communicate our message in such a way as to get our message across. Okay. Um, I imagine that Ingrid doesn't write with her students. I mean, if they're not really reading, they're probably not writing. Um, but Jocelyn and Mr. Jesus, <clears throat> Fernando and Mr. Guerrero, are you guys writing with your students? Yes. yes. Okay. Cool. Then this is going to be useful for us. Let's go on. Could you read this, please, Mr. Morales? Yes, um, writing. Writing has uh, sub skills that are divided into two parts. The first set of sub skills are linked to accuracy. I love, I hate that word. The second set of sub skills are linked to communicating our ideas. Very good. Well, you pronounced accuracy very well, man. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So yes, guys, remember, we, we have to pay close attention to the sub skills. Okay, pay very close attention to them. Um, in this case, we have two sets, accuracy and communicating our ideas. Let's see what the first one is about. This one has a lot more than reading, okay? Um, Jocelyn, could you read the sub skills for accuracy, please? Okay, writing sub skills related to accuracy, cohesion. Spelling correctly, forming letters correctly, joining letters together correctly, writing legibly, uh, punctuating correctly, using correct layouts, choosing the right vocabulary, using grammar correctly. And number nine, joining sentences correctly. And the last one, correctly, using paragraphs. A lot of correctly. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, do you understand every sub skill? Some of them are obvious, like spelling and punctuating. You understand all of them? Yes. yes. Okay. Do for those of layouts, you who, sorry, using correct layouts, the what does that 
Okay. So, you know, um, layouts is like, are you writing a letter, a report, um, an essay? And, you know, all of these have different layouts. Like the letter you're going to say, dear, blah, 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 blah. Like the structure? Exactly. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. The format. Yeah, the format. That's, that's the word I was looking for. So, yes, yes. Um, do you practice all of these skills for those of you who write? Teacher Jesus, Justin, do you practice all of these? Do you Not focus the on them? Time, but yes, <laughs> but yes, I try to use all of them. Yes, okay, okay, I like that, I like that. You know, the first one they usually learn is forming letters correctly. They, they do this as kids, right? As babies, they learn how to write A, how to write B. Okay, okay. Very good. Now let's go to the other sub skills. Oh, can I move on? Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right. And these are the sub skills for communicating ideas. Uh, Mr. Melgar, could you read this, please? Writing sub skills related to communicating ideas are, uh, in parentheses, coherent. Uh, point one, using appropriate style and register. Organizing ideas in a helpful way. Using features typical of the text type we are writing. Joining our words and sentences cleanly, using appropriate functions to express our meaning. Yes. Does everybody know what register is in this case? Okay. In this case, register is like formality. Um, are you being formal or informal? Like, are you talking to a friend or are you, you know, writing a business letter? It, that is the register right there. So, do you have any questions about the other sub skills? No? Okay. Now, it's important to work on both types of sub skills the accuracy and then the communicating ideas part. Um, I, I have had students who are really good at the grammar and things like that, but when you read their stories, they don't make any sense. Like they're talking about one thing and then talking about another thing, talking about another thing. They're not communicating their ideas well. Um, so, you know, it's important to just focus on, you know, communicating ideas one day and then on the other um, on accuracy. It all depends on your students. It all depends on the objective. All right, can I move on? Yes. All right. Guys, for, for all of you who write um, and who have your students writing at least a paragraph, this is one of the best things right here, the creative writing process. Have you heard of this? Have you heard of the creative writing process? Okay, excellent, excellent. So you're doing this, I love that. All right. Well, the creating process, as most of you know, involves brainstorming ideas. You have to think about what you're going to write about. You're going to plan it. What things are you going to say first, second, and third? And then you're going to write your first draft. The first draft is like the first version of your text. And then you're going to edit. That means change big things. And then you're going to proofread, change little things like the spelling and the uh, punctuation and things like that. And after you do that, it is a good idea to write a second draft so you don't return it with all of those erase marks and it's ugly. Just write it again on another piece of paper. That's an important step that we should make our students do. All right, let's see. Can I move on? Hello, good morning teacher Angie. All right. 
Let's talk about writing. Can somebody answer this question for me, please? How do you do writing activities in your classrooms? What are the steps? We have to choose the topic first. Mm -hmm. uh, in my case, the book I am currently using in high school, um, it uh, usually connects the grand activity with the reading activity, okay? So, uh, and, that, and I think that's good because uh, they already uh, are in the correct state of mind. I mean, they are in the top in, they are like already used to the topic that I wanted to write about. Uh, so for example, there was a, there was a, a unit where the topic was fashion, okay? So the, the article talked about the, the way that different people dress and stuff like that. So uh, what I did was uh, I told the students to create a catalog and I told them to bring several pictures and stuff. And it was a, a lovely activity because the students uh, it was, uh, I mean, the, the, the unit was uh, cool. So the students, uh, the, the catalog that they created were like very beautiful and they were constantly asking me, teacher, how do you say a uh, simangas? Teacher, how do you say this? So they were like very into the, into the, the activity. Okay, so maybe like, that is like one process. First, I do the reading, and then uh, I brainstorm, and I like make the uh, uh, get involved in the topic, and then I start with the writing. I give them what to, to I tell them what to write about. Nice, nice. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Okay, and Teacher Morales, Andres, and oh yes, Teacher Angie, do you do writing in your classrooms? Do you do writing? In your class? Yeah, yeah, I do. Okay. And right. this is the end of the topic. We we try to write a, a, a postcard or a informal letter, letter or a small uh, paragraph using the information that we already um, got. Nice, nice. Oh, uh, I'm I'm glad that your books have the the reading first and then the writing that's that's great that's how i think that's how it should be you know so they can use it as an example right okay um how do you check writing how do you check writing mr Morales? how do you check writing? do you check it of course i have to all right pretty cool oh it's kind of uh it's kind of difficult because I teach kids. And uh, for example, I, when I tell them the, show them the topic, um, I have to, to the, okay, kids, we have to uh, write something about this. And you don't need to, to write a lot, but I, I need at least that you can make a little fort. So, First of all, I tell them, okay, can you tell me what are you going what are you going to, to write about, for example? Because kids love speak. Yeah. And they, they don't like to write, for example. They don't like to write, uh -huh, writing, oh I I uh, uh, okay. They don't like so I have to okay, now that you have told me that, okay, now let's write it. Okay, I'm going to help you with which idea are you going to start? So it's uh, it's kind of weird. After that, okay, I have to, 
to read and then, and then, okay. I think you can change the idea for this, okay? Remember that we told, that, that I told you in class that you can use this idea or you can uh, change this word, uh, remember the auxiliary or something like that because they are kids and it's kind of difficult to, uh, to teach how to write. That's true. But I, but I do check, I do check it all the time. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you found like a way, you know, to kind of, you know, manipulate them. You know, first you make them speak and yeah. then you make them write. It's nice, nice. But, but how do you like check it? Like after they write, what do you do? Do you mark it? Do you correct it? Of course I have to, to mark it all the time. For example, when in the class, in, in classroom, for example, I, I can, I can read, I, um, Sorry, French, it's in my mind right now. Ah, um, okay, after after I read, ah, that's, that's cool. Okay. You, you, you can you can think about other languages. Oh my god. Okay, after I read, I uh, I read the paper and okay, I always have a have a pen. And remember that you can do this. Okay. Sometimes I have to admit that I correct so much. So the, the paper is always with my notes. And I remember that uh, once uh, last year, um, some parents told me that I was kind of rude of doing that because, oh my God. It, Please, teacher, they are kids. So, yeah, I know they are kids, but they are learning and I have to guide them to do the right thing. So it's, uh, they told me that I was rude. Now that we are in online classes, it's, it's so weird because they sent the assignment to, to Google Classroom, for example, and I do the same thing. So in the comments part, I also, okay, remember that uh, you're saying this and this and this and this and this. And sometimes there are a lot of notes and Yeah, I think so. But I, I, I like what he I like what he's saying. He is firm. He doesn't he doesn't care about the parents' comments. He says, "No, we are learning. That's good. We have to be firm because we don't want our students to be sensitive. You know, um, we can start at a young age. And look, I, I asked I was asking you guys how do you check your writing because it's it's important to have a correction code." Do you guys use a correction code? No. Okay. Well, um, wh whenever students give you their writing and they write something like, let's talk about beginners because this applies to anything. Um, I is happy. Okay. Or how about this? With a little I. I is happy. They write something like this. Um, the, the, the worst thing you can do is correct it for them. No, it's not I is, it's I. You know, don't, don't do that. Don't correct it for them, okay? That doesn't give them any room to improve. You're basically saying, here, Miko, it's like this. You know, it, it, it's not like that. You need to use a correction code, okay? Uh, for example, one, one of my correction codes is like if they write a lowercase letter when it should be uppercase, I, I underline it two times, okay? And if they write the wrong word, I circle it, okay? And I just give them, I give them the sentence like that. Sure, what is this? Oh. My friend, if you have two lines, 
that means you need to work on the case. Case means lowercase, uppercase, little letter, big letter. And if you have a circle, that means you need to change the word. Okay, change the word. If they forgot the period, then what I like to do is I like to draw this little arrow right there. If you have an arrow, then you need to add punctuation. Okay. Two arrows add a word. Okay. Now um, let me give you an example. I think food all the time. Uh, we know that it's missing a word right here. I think about or I think of, right? So if you draw two arrows, then they will know to put a word in there. I think about, I think of. So, you know, we should never correct our students, but we should always tell them the things they got wrong so they can go and fix it. Okay, now I know this is a lot of work for the teacher. You know, you, you get the paper, you correct it, you return them. They give you the paper again and they have mistakes again and you return it. But this is how you make great writers. Okay, and this is just uh, a little bit of correction codes. You can go on Google and, and write correction code for writing and and many will appear many will appear you don't have to use symbols maybe you can use colors you know green is for punctuation red is for case okay purple is for adding or it you can google that or you can make your own like i made my own um whatever i thought is easy and like i said this will help you make a great writer really really Okay, uh, I remember that I, th thanks to God, I had a great English teacher when I was in the United States and um, they, like it, in my school, you could not graduate if you did not write a senior project, you know, the, the last grade project. And part of the project was to write a five page report on your career okay we all had to choose a career or something we wanted to do and we had to you know write a report on our career i remember that at first I, I am a really slow writer so i was always the last student to finish writing and i would give my paper to my teacher she would correct it and give it to me okay and she would only put like five or six corrections i'm like oh only five or six mistakes cool and then i returned it to my teacher corrected and then she finds five other mistakes I'm like what why didn't you just give why didn't you just give me uh, all the mistakes at first and they're like because you're gonna get stressed I'm like oh. but now I'm stressed because you're making me do it again like she's like just do it just do it I'm like okay and she, she, I, we were like this for a long time I give her my paper she give it back I give her my paper she give it back we did this seven times we did this seven times, but, and, and I used to hate her. I was like, why can't you just correct it for me, lady? But now, you know, that I am an English teacher, I appreciate her so much because it has, it honestly helped me become a great writer. And she was like that all year, all year. And guys, you, if you have time, if you have time, um, do this, okay? Do this. It will honestly help your students become great writers. Don't correct your students. Show them their mistakes so they can correct it and they can learn from their mistakes. Okay? I have a question. Tell me, sir. Uh, okay, I understand. I like the idea you know, that you don't have to correct the students, but for example, for example, because I am so rude, according to the parents. Um, how can I do this kind of 
universal code with kids, for example. Because, okay, I, I think it's very interesting, um, kind of challenging, but uh, how can I use it with the kids? Because I think, are they going to understand that, for example, two lines equals a case or a circle equals to change the word or something like that? Okay, okay. good question, man. Um, well, th there are two things I want to say there. Um, first, you should teach them the correction code, you know, like when you return the paper to them, also send them the correction code. Okay, Fulanito, si te puse esta marca, tienes que hacer esto. O si te puse esta marca, es salió mal. Tienes este tipo de error. Um, but another thing is like, like you said, if, if they are children and, and they are beginners and they make a mistake that they don't really know yet, like maybe you're teaching the verb to be and in the present and they're making mistakes with the verb to be in the past or the present perfect, then in that case, you should correct it because they don't know how to correct it. Um, so the only time where you should correct your students is when you have to correct your students, like when they don't know what's going on or when, um, or when, when they just, you know, you, you give them the paper and they're just like, no, teacher, no, no, no say. And I'm uh, fine, okay, fine, you know, you, know, you correct it. Um, but, but with children, I don't know. You, I think if you show them the correction code and maybe only like not do so many, maybe you just do like three types of correction codes and then you correct the rest, like maybe you can correct the grammar but they need to correct the, the spelling or, or the punctuation, maybe like that, you know, begin little by little. Or, or what do you think, Teacher Morales? Okay, but, or, or can I use, for example, um, colors? Oh, yes, we're I mean, about that. green for a verb or yellow for uh, exactly. a verb, something like that, I think, because they're kids and they love colors because I think would be easier them. I don't know. Yeah. I think it's I think he gave you a, an instructor, but at the end, like you can create your own code. Because yeah. we have we have like I think Teacher Morales and I have done that. We have like uh, we rely a lot on colors. I mean, I uh, with in elementary school, I rely on colors a lot. Uh, auxiliary with green, subject with blue, so, uh, and I think we already established a code for the color, so, uh, I mean, I'm telling you this because uh, sometimes uh, we help each other, it's like, how do you do this, how do you do that, so uh, we, ha we have like a pattern, of, we have a pattern already, so uh, maybe you can rely on the colors, and that could be, and that also can be like a, a good uh, correction code for you. Yes. And correct the grammar. Exactly, exactly. Yes, Mr. Morales, you can definitely use colors. Um, th this is just one type of correction code. And um, uh, as I said, you, you don't even have to make your own. You can just Google a correction codes for writing and choose the best one that you like. And I, I think colors are great for children, man. That's definitely going to be better. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, guys. Guys, do you have any any questions? No? All right. So let's move on to the next skill. Or shall we reflect? Yeah, let's reflect. Let's reflect. I'm going to, I'm going to put you in a group, okay, with two other teachers. Um, if you can, on your cell phone, please pull up the writing reflection image. So you can discuss these questions um, like we did with the uh, reading reflection. You're going to read the comments from teachers. You're going to say whether you agree or not. I agree because this, I don't agree because this, and then maybe you can share your experience with the sentences, okay? And I will be dropping in in your sessions so I can hear what you say, hear your opinions and stuff like that, okay? So please enter the breakout room and discuss these comments.
Technic ascent, right? Yes. So we already, we have uh, three ideas. Uh, number one, I don't write confidently in English myself. I don't really know how to improve either. When I teach writing, I usually focus more on accuracy than on communicating ideas. And my learners find writing really boring. I do it as little as possible. So, uh, should I start or? Uh, me, for example, uh, I think I write uh, confidently in English. I, I don't know. Mm, I'm not bad at it, but I'm, I mean, obviously, I'm not the best. But I think that the knowledge that I have, I can share with my students and to help them improve and i don't know i think sometimes it's bad to focus a lot on accuracy i sometimes make the mistake of uh concentrating on accuracy especially if the writing activity uh involves grammar that i already thought okay so it's like i already told you that this is a uh, present perfect why are you writing like this so uh, that's when I concentrate on accuracy, when I already thought the topic, eh, if it's something that, if it's something new, then maybe uh... See, look again. Hi, Jesus. Ya nos regresaste. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hello, hello. Hello. Okay, okay. También Alice se traba mucho. A mí se me va cada rato. ¿eh? Okay. Oh. Sí, hombre. Así ya, ya está fastidiado, te lo juro. Pero bueno, ya. <ríe> ok, ya estamos ahí. Entonces, um, writing the picture, you have in your uh, cell on this. Um, yeah, here's this thing about these comments from do teachers. Which do you agree with and why? Number one says, I don't write confidently in English myself. I don't really know how to improve either. So, what do you think about it? In online, I, I, now I'm not really, really using a lot of writing activities. I mean, Writing like um, only short or small patterns, yes. but not completely um, because I, I feel so hard to, to check all these um, homeworks. Or I didn't read <laughs> how many groups that we have. So, so I they just I can say it's just like a small paragraph, you know, this okay, depending on the topic that we are working with, and I said, and I. And they, what they do is, is read it, okay? And what did you say? Okay, and I, and I always correct them, yeah, but Fernando says that we, teacher Fernando says that we, we don't have to do it though, so. But if that's easier for me to check, okay, then. I don't know if I explain <laughs> well. Yeah, you mix them. Yeah, I, yeah. I understood, yes, I understood. It's, it's not like a, I omit or mistake. Okay, I, uh, I get what you want to say. I'm going to omit your mistakes. No, it's like uh, I know what you are trying to say, but what you wrote, what you wrote is wrong. And I maybe I like you can you rephrase it 
Okay, I understand, yes. but maybe it sounds better if you say yes, it's not better. correct. Yeah. And finally, uh, yes, there might be some writing activities boring. And if I think they are important, if they are necessary for the students, uh, even if they are boring, I ask students to do it, to do it because <laughs> well now it's boring and now it's boring, but you have to learn this. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I uh. Like I told you, we had this activity, we had this writing activity that was about proverbs. And I mean, it's boring. I mean, for me, it, I mean, I, I don't like them. I mean, I think they're dull. So me as an, if me as an adult, if I, if me as an adult don't like it, I mean, the students who are teenagers are obviously not going to like that activity it's either. So. And I changed that activity. I, I skipped that and I did something else. <laughs> I no I um, <laughs> teacher Juan Andrea. I I I I am lost. <laughs> what remember the activity sent uh Right in the reflection. It's in the group. Uh-huh. And they Yeah, I Yes, I the general idea. Uh-huh. Yes, of course, the general idea. For example, I remember I that the uh, and last November with the uh, with the uh, in French class, for example, that I told them that okay, I need you to uh, write um what are you going to wear if you are invited to a wedding, for example? And there, and there are students that that says okay, that say statement. Mm, no. Yeah, I mean, I don't think this applies to us. All of us are really good. Teacher, so yeah. Second when I teach writing, I usually focus more on accuracy, accuracy, and the, than on communicating ideas. Well, I, I, I think that both are together. No, we, we are. We can focus on on communicate, communicating ideas. Because you 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 are writing, you are uh, writing about a topic that you 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 are communicating ideas in writing, of course. No? And my learner find writing really boring. I do it as little as possible. Well, I have students they great. They like they like to write, <laughs> and in, at the end of the book we have a a sentence maker and they 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 like to to make sentences with these these structures they like to write they like to well, so they they asked me to to give them a, a writing exercise they do yeah <laughs> yes <That's it. laughs> i have to tell them what to write about in elementary school because they are loved. They don't like to yeah. But it's excellent. It's really cool that your students love that and ask for like writing activities. I wish mine did that. I wish mine did that. But yeah, I think I think we finished. Thank you. Hello.
Well, guys, uh, we're going to go on break at 11 o'clock, okay? okay. At 18 minutes. Let's try to finish this last skill. Okay. Well, the next skill. Next skill is listening. Angie, could you read this, please? Angie? Okay. Listening, like reading, listening is a receptive skill. Listening involves making sense of the main sound of language. We do this by making use of context, language, and our knowledge of the world. Listening involves understanding spoken language. All right. Yes, we know that already. But this is the good stuff. Could you read this one too, Angie? Listening substitute. Listening for gifts, global understanding, general idea. Listening for specific information, listening for detail, inferring attitude, listening extensively, and listening intensively. Very good. Thank you. Uh, teachers, what do you think? Number four is inferring attitude. What does that mean? A tone voice. Can you repeat that? A tone of voice. A tone of voice, okay, okay. Uh, what do you do with the tone of voice? Well, Like why, why is the tone of voice important? Oh, because we can infer in what happened in the, in the situation and we can infer the context. They help to understand the, whatever, what, what we are listening. Okay, okay, yes, that's true. We can get a better understanding of the attitude of the speaker, right? Are they angry, sad, happy? Very good, very good. All right, here are some tips to improve listening. Ms. Belize, could you read this, please? Yes, some listening, some tips to improve listening, taking a deep breath before listening, understanding what the listening task is asking for exactly, predicting what the listening will be about, closing your eyes while you listen, picturing what the speaker is saying, Increasing vocabulary by listening to music with lyrics, watching movies with subtitles. Nice. Yes, guys. Um, let's let's talk about this a little bit. You know, a, a lot of times when we're going to do a listening activity, you know, well, not us because we're teachers, but our students, they feel you know tense. They feel tense. So you know, something to relieve that tension is you know taking a deep breath. You know, just. Breathe in really deeply and breathe out slowly before doing the listening, right? And then the next thing is, you know, you can really, you have to really understand what the listening task is about. Is it asking for the general idea or are we listening for something specific? Are we inferring attitude? If you know that the task is asking for it specifically, you only focus for that thing, okay? So if, if the question is how old was Jimmy when he started high school, then you're only going to be listening for the age. Everything else is unimportant, okay? Or if you are listening for the general idea, then you're probably gonna be paying attention to the first few sentences of the listening, okay? And of course, if you have pictures, or in, in like in the book, then you can predict what the listening will be about. That will help you so much. That will make you an active listener because you are, you know, participating in the listening, all right? And a, another thing, like if, when your students have um, like listening tests, tell them to read the questions first and the answers and then tell them to close their eyes. If they disactivate, you know, their seeing, then they're, listening will be enhanced and it will eliminate any distractions, okay? 
And once they hear the answer, you know, they can open their eyes, circle the answer, close their eyes again quickly and do that. Um, this works a lot, especially on the online, the online classes. Um, because, you know, you're at your house, your family is here, your pets are here, you have a lot of distractions. So if you close your eyes, you know, you eliminate the distraction and you enhance your listening. Okay. Uh, another thing, if, if your student is a visual person, Tell them to picture, you know, what they are hearing, okay? Don't just listen, you know, try to project it in your, in your mind. Imagine that. What, where is it? Who is speaking? What are they doing? What are they wearing? How are they feeling? How are they looking at each other? What is their body language? All right? And, of course, one of the biggest things is sometimes our students don't understand because they don't have vocabulary. So it, it is very important, especially if they are beginners, to listen to music with lyrics. Okay? When our students see the word and hear it at the same time, you know, the brain does something beautiful where they can understand it very well. All right. Let's see. Let's reflect. Let's reflect. Well, first, before we do that, do you guys have any listening tips for us, any recommendations that we can do, please share your ideas. Come on, I know everybody has at least one. Keywords. Keywords. Yeah, listen for keywords. Listen, listen for keywords. Okay, that's a good one. for keywords. Okay, okay. Jocelyn, Mr. Juan Andres, Tocayo, Jesus. Um, with beginners, sometimes uh, I make them listen and I tell them to identify vocabulary that we that we already uh, saw. I mean, that is a tip for, for beginners. I mean, they're not uh, getting the general idea, but they're just looking for vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Only. Yeah. So it's like an activity, right? Hmm? It's like an extra activity, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like at the before we start with the listening activity, it's like a warm up. I mean, uh, it's a it's like a warm up for me. Where it's like, okay, let's listen to this. Okay, and what words can you identify from the vocabulary? Oh, well, uh, I, I heard a competition. Oh, a, I don't know, a college. And I'm like, oh, yeah, correct. And now a, let's listen again and what happens there. And yeah, and that way uh, they listen like, like twice, three times. Okay? That's a good one. I need to apply that one. Sounds interesting. It makes them active. Okay, okay. Depend on the, the topic. So to be uh, listen carefully for, for for when we are talking or listening. Uh, no, no, no. When we are talking about the dates, okay. Focus on on, on facts like dates, places, etc. No, we are talking or. What people is doing, or what do they do? They, that's very important. Focus on them. And then. That's a good one. That's a good yeah. one. Okay, and that will also help them, you know, like picture what's going on, right? Okay, cool, cool. I like that. All right, guys. Now, um, another thing. I. Well, I. It, it is very important that. The listening activities are easier than the listening. Um, and what that means is like, you know, being able to listen and understand is different than being able to show that you understand. Okay. <clears throat> so if I ask, what is the topic of the conversation? Okay. Maybe you know 
maybe you know the topic, maybe you understood the topic, but you don't know how to answer the question. You know what I mean? It's, that happens a lot to our students, you know, ah, si entendí, pero no sé cómo contestar. Uh, now, sometimes they use that as an excuse, but sometimes it's real, you know? Sometimes it's real. So what you can do to counter that is give them options. Give them options. A, B, C, or D. What is the topic about? Okay, now it's easy because they have options and they can circle the correct options. Now they can only no. Choose one. Choose one. What do you think the topic is about? And uh, this, I, I noticed a lot that and, you know, in the past, my students would say, ah, teacher, es que el listening se me hace bien difícil. Um, the problem was not the listening. The problem was answering the listening. So when, when I started implementing this, you know, giving them options, I, ha I have never heard a complaint about listening ever again. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, they can, they can listen, but they don't know how to answer. You know, they don't know how to write the answer in their notebook or they don't know how to tell the answer to a partner. Maybe they are scared, but if you give them an option, you know, they will know. Now, I know some of you saying, ah, oh, but it's too easy. It needs to be easy because listening is one thing and, and showing that you can listen is another thing, okay? And plus, if they take a test, they're gonna have options too. So, you know, it's kind of like a help. Um, this worked a lot with me and maybe if you don't do this, it will work a lot with you too. Let's, let's reflect a little bit now. Let's reflect on the listening. We're gonna do this one together. Before we begin, do you have any questions? No, everything's good? Okay. Listening reflection. Think about these questions for teachers. Which do you agree with and why? Number one, to improve their listening, what my students need most is to learn more vocabulary. Learning listening skills won't help them. What do you think, Mr. Guerrero? What is your opinion about the first one? Learning listening skills won't help them. Let me, let me catch the idea. Okay, go ahead, sir. Well, uh, to improve the listening, uh, what my student need most is to learn more vocabulary, learning, listening skill won't help them. Um, well, I, I think that, that, that they, they listen, they listen in order to identify some new words or phrases, verbs, or, or maybe, you know, that, that is the, the, the object of listening. Mm, okay, okay, so you think listening will help them with learn more, yeah. learning more vocabulary, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now, what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you other guys think about this? It says, to improve their listening, what they need to do is learn more vocabulary. Le learning listening skills won't help them. Do you agree with this, Angie, Jocelyn, Jesus, Fernando? I do agree with this. I think, for example, kids need to learn more vocabulary. Um, in fact, when we learn vocabulary, I mime, okay? Uh, sore throat, <clears throat> cough, okay? Or something like that. And when I play the listening exercise, they are, they all the time are, what did he say? And because I don't want to, to, to say the word, I always mime. Remember, remember, <coughs> what is that? Remember, what is that? Ah, cough, okay, right, we can continue. So sometimes I mime with them, okay? And that is, uh, that's, what, what, that's what I do when remembering the vocabulary and all the time I say, oh my God, I think this vocabulary needs another word. Okay, kids, let's learn another word because I think it's more important to learn it because perhaps, perhaps you can use it on, on this exercise. So I think we need more words, more vocabulary to this. 
and I like I, I love that um, that little method of of miming. I, I need to apply that more in my class. That's really cool. And love that. Yeah, right. It's, it's real fun. It's like if I was your student, I would have fun. It's awesome. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I love music. It's really, really important to, to learn more vocabulary. For example, when uh, in I remember a topic about the planets and uh, about the environment, no, and this natural disaster, something like that. So, and when we finish that that unit, I I I check some. We, we check. We saw with my students some in YouTube documentaries. And they start oh my god and they and I, and I was really excited watching them because they are they were understanding that they said oh my gosh <laughs> I was so happy and proud of the their the, our job no their, our work or what we did in that unit I remember that and I was so excited really really I was in elementary in, in fifth grade it was last year and we were in in normal classes yeah oh, wow, it's, that's cool. I like it very much and they understood. Most of the things they were mentioned as that's, that's, awesome. <laughs> well, that's nice. So in your case, vocabulary is very important because they were able to understand something that was real. I like that. I like that. You guys have very valid points. Let's let's go on to the second one. The second one says, I don't think my learners should listen to me for listening practice. There is no point in them listening to English spoken with my accent. What do you think about Disagree. this? <laughs> Disagree. Why, Miss Belize? Because uh, the more accents you listen, the more used to you get to the language. Yes. Um, I remember when I was uh, I was in Harmon Hall, and sometimes uh, it was they choose only one teacher for like four uh, levels, and I remember that that teacher had like a very uh, marked accent. She was always like, listening or uh, need is learn. So it was like very like Mexican and that, and it was good. I mean, that was her accent, but it was kind of difficult for me for, because when I started teaching them, uh, the way that I speak is different than the way that she speaks. So uh, I, I was speaking and speaking and they were like, I, I don't understand because teacher that speaks this way. And I'm like, well, I don't do that. So, <laughs> so I'm sorry, you have to get used to the way that I speak. I'm not going to change that. So, um, and I don't know, I think it's, it's, it's very, very important uh, uh, for students to listen to different accents because not everyone, not everyone speaks the same way. Yes, and so basically variety is important, right? Yes, yes, that's good. Now, if they are beginners, then what Cambridge recommends is that, you know, they listen to one, you know, type of accent, they get used to it, then you can start introducing them to more accents, to more accents. That's good. All right, guys. Well, um, it is 11 o'clock. Let's go on the break, okay? I will see you at 11.30, all right? 31. <laughs> oh, 11.31, okay? 31. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> all right. One minute, one minute. <laughs> all right. okay. I'll see you at 11.31, guys. Please uh, be on time. Yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah. All right, so guys, we have discussed reading, writing, and listening, right? Now we're going to discuss the last skill, which is speaking. Um, I have a question before we begin. Um, do you guys have the chats for your students to practice speaking in your classes now that you have online classes? school and high school yes in elementary school is a little bit more difficult more challenging yes how many uh, your, your classes are 50 minutes how many of those 50 minutes do you use for speaking activities for middle school and high school 
like uh, what what you what you mean uh, with this by with the speaking is the the thing uh, like conversations and stuff like that yeah like or, how, how much time do your students speak in class uh like 20 minutes you could say mm -hmm. sometimes it's not just like a speaking uh, activities it's uh it's more like okay what did you do oh no teacher um, uh yesterday i so they are they share stories they're okay, catching them. up okay mm -hmm. cool. Nice, nice. Oh, that's good. I'm glad you can get to speak in, in your classes. It's kind of difficult with 50 minutes and online. Definitely, definitely. Very challenging. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, okay, guys. These are the speaking sub skills. Hello, Fernando. Welcome to the class. Um, hey, welcome. Fernanda, could you read this, please? The sub skills. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, speaking, the speaking sub skills are making use of grammar, vocabulary, and functions, making use of register to speak appropriately, using features of connected speech, using body language, producing different text types, fluency, in parentheses, speaking at the normal speed with a little hesitation, reputation, or self-correction, and with smooth use of connected speech. And finally, using interactive strategies, parentheses, ways of uh, keeping people interested and involved in what we are saying. All right, very good. Now, for those of you who do practice uh, speaking in your classes, do you, would you consider that you practice all of these? Sub skills? No. Which one do you think you don't practice or don't practice enough? Register is the formality, no? Yes. Uh, yeah, so maybe making use of register to speak up. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was a little difficult, right? You have to role play. Yeah. It is, uh, it's very difficult to the students to switch from formal to informal. They are constantly speaking like informally. That's true, that's true. I mean, even I speak informally sometimes to them. So it's like tricky. Mm -hmm. And um, something that might be difficult, you know, now with online classes is, you know, using your body language, right? Um, sometimes our students don't even activate the cameras, or I don't know if your students activate the cameras, but sometimes mine, mine don't. <clears throat> so it's, you know, very difficult. You know, if you can't see the person that you're talking to, because the body language says a lot, right? All right, and here we go with, with this one, producing different text types. Th this is, what I meant earlier by reading, you know, texts, it, it is a speaking um, ability, right? When you, when you are reading the text, reading a book out loud, that is speaking. It's a combination of reading and speaking, okay? Now, let's move on. So I, I, loved, I love the speaking part. <clears throat> so, all right, guys, just listen while I read this to you. In our classes, we have to make sure that we have a variety of accuracy and fluency lessons. And we also have to include activities that learners only focus on one or two sub skills at a time. Okay, so here are our sub skills. You know, they should only focus on one or two at a time. You know, don't try to focus on grammar, fluency, and body language all at the same time. You know, it's too much. You know, maybe just focus on body language and fluency. Or maybe just grammar, you know, one or two things at a time. And accuracy activities usually go first, then other subskill activities, and finally the fluency activities. You know, so it's, it's kind of like building confidence. You know, I, I'm going to show you how to do it correctly, and you need to do it correctly, and then we can practice a little bit more, and then you can be free. Practice your fluency. Okay, it's kind of like building the steps. <clears throat> 
This is one of the most important things right here. This, this, this last tab. When you have fluency activities, it is extremely important to not interrupt your learners' conversations when they make a mistake. Okay, it is sometimes best to ignore the mistake completely. But if you must correct it, say it's part of the learning objective of the day, then write it down and tell your learners about the mistake after the fluency activity. Do not interrupt the flow. Okay, and, and that is why we have accuracy activities and then we have fluency activities. And the accuracy activities, you know, it's controlled. You are controlling. If you hear a mistake, you correct it. Okay, you drill them or um, listen and repeat, listen and repeat. But when they are practicing fluency, like role playing, don't interrupt. You're going to mess up the flow and they will never have flow if you're always interrupting them. Okay, and, and this is one of the biggest things. Uh, I remember when I worked at Harmon Hall, our coordinator would always tell us, you know, you need to correct your students. You need to correct our students. And so that, that was always my, you know, my thing. I need to correct my students, I need to correct my students. And as I started, you know, learning, I took the TKT and all this stuff, I noticed that for some activities, yes, you need to correct. And right there immediately. And in others- So at the time, at the time of the year is speaking, we have to correct them? No, no, no. Well, it depends what the activity so, so is. Why don't they finish uh -huh. and to, to make some uh, corrections? Yes, yes. Uh, it, it depends on your activity, Miss Angie. Um, like, if you're going to, like, if, if, if they're reading the conversation that's in the book, you know, to get, you know, a little bit of practice, um, there you can correct them. Correct their spelling, correct their connected speech, I'm not spelling, connect their correct their pronunciation, their connected speech, their intonation. Um, if it's a like showing surprise by saying really, then maybe you can practice intonation. You know, they cannot be boring if it's surprising. Yeah, really? You know, they have to show a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, so you can correct that. But whenever they have to like do role play activities, don't, don't correct them in that moment. If you want to correct them, you can, but wait when they, wait until they finish, all right? Because um, if, if they don't, then they will never have flow. They will never be fluent. They, they will say things correctly, but they will always hesitate to speak because we don't give them the time to just, you know, fly. You know, if they, they, they begin to fly and we bring them down. You know, we just let them fly and let them fly, fly, fly. They're gonna build a lot of confidence and it's okay. And sometimes like in my classes, I don't even correct my students, but I, but I tell them, I tell them like, okay, okay guys, uh, for this activity, um, I just want you to speak without stop. You know, it, it doesn't matter if you don't know a word, try to explain it in another way um, and don't speak in Spanish. The most important thing is just flow. If you make a mistake, don't worry, it's okay. Just focus on speaking without stop you know make it clear you know because sometimes students will be like teacher what's teacher how do you say the teacher was and they mess up the flow they stop the conversation to ask you a question and that's not good either okay <clears throat> do you guys have any questions with this it is very interesting because uh it is, it is difficult for me to uh, to not uh, like correct them at first it's kind of it is difficult because i got used to correct them immediately so i will try not to uh not to do that as yeah. often you got used to it because of Harmon hall right yes i did <laughs> i know we are we are traumatized um but yes guys uh Try this. I, I promise you, you know, it, it's not good. You're, you're not going to notice a big change immediately, but wait a few months and you will see that your students are like speaking really well. Um, I have, I have this group that I have had for a year and what one time they spoke without stopping for 20 minutes. And I, I couldn't imagine it. like they were just having a role play. Like, uh, I told them to imagine you are the salesperson at, at the, the hotel 
show them around the hotel, promote your hotel, and you, you are the guest, you know, be a little difficult, but be nice. And, you know, they, I can't believe they did that for 20 minutes. And I was just listening to the reserve. And they made mistakes. Of course, they made mistakes. And, you know, I, I was taking notes of their mistakes. And when they finished, I told them, they would say like, ah, yes, teacher, yes, I knew that, but, and, and that happens. A lot of times when you are speaking, you know, speaking, you make mistakes and you don't even notice, but it's good because you are flowing. And so, sometimes um, that's more important, the fluency than the accuracy, okay? <clears throat> now, it depends on your students too, right? Maybe, you know, they don't need to be fluent. Maybe they just need to pass a test. So you have to work on the accuracy. You know, it all depends on your students and it depends on their goals and it depends on your program, okay? But if, you, if your program allows to work on fluency, do it. It's beautiful, okay? All right, let's go. Speaking reflection. All right. Think about these comments from teachers. Which do you agree with and mm -hmm. why? Um, now, here, in this case, I haven't heard, I haven't heard Mr. Guerrero. So I, I would like to hear something from him. Oh, yes, I have. Angie, Ingrid, I, I want the quiet ones to participate, okay? So I'm gonna read it to you slowly, explain it, and then you give me your opinion. My students get really embarrassed talking and making mistakes in front of their classmates. So I don't often ask them to speak in class. Sorry for this, item. I don't ask them to speak in class. Is this the case for any of you? I'm not agree. You don't agree? Okay. Not really. Uh, my students are, are um, they like to speak and then they don't be shy. They are little kids and, and I don't have problem with this, I That's think. Great. Not That's in the great. motion. That's great. That's great. So you, you don't have any bullies in your class? Ah, don't, don't. No? They're kids. That doesn't exist in kindergarten. Sometimes it does, man. Sometimes it does. Well, yes. It's really, true. It's really interesting. But um, it, it's beautiful when you don't have bullies in the class. I, it's the best. Um, how about you guys? Jocelyn, Jesus, Angie. Um, do you have problems with this? Um, I agree. Uh, I think uh, like teenagers are like afraid or embarrassed to make mistakes, so they don't uh, always speak. But um, I remember when I uh, I the way I evaluated one month was with an oral exam, and they were very nervous. And I remember that I told them that. Sometimes the, the language or puts you in uncomfortable situations. So maybe you have to, you have to adapt. Okay, so uh, it's not that I don't uh, make them speak. Uh, okay, they like sometimes I have to like force them to, to speak. Uh, because like I, like I told them, oh, imagine you are, uh, you meet a, uh, you meet an American, you are, aren't you going to talk to them or what are you going to do if they ask you a question? I mean, sometimes the language is about putting you in uncomfortable situations and spontaneous things. So that's sometimes, uh, and they hate me for that, but it's like, in that, that's why I, I tell them, okay. I don't know. I don't know yes. what I said, sorry. <laughs> yeah, they might hate you, but you're doing a good thing for them, right? Ms. Ange, do you agree with this? Uh, in, in high school, they are really shy. So, no, me, no. 
okay, to say, oh, come on, you can do it. Say it's not me. I, I always are, it's really hard to, to try with this students because they are really shy. And, no, I, I can read very well. No, no, I know that. Or ne the next, the next, and things like that. No, but yeah, sometimes it's when I want to uh, work uh, or complete an activity really fast. So I said, I'm not going to, for example, because he's always complaining about it. So, and sometimes I, I don't ask them, but uh, when I uh, I have um, like um, introducing a topic, I try to they uh, or vocabulary or things like that. I, I I push them to participate, and I I really I say like, come on, you can do it, okay? But when we are uh, in a hurry lesson, so I I put them <laughs> in the other way. That's nice. That's nice. But I but I always try to. To improve them, but this is, this is really hard. Not in kindergarten. <laughs> yeah, some of them just really are shy, like you say. Okay, um, Mr. Morales, do you agree with this comment? Well, I uh, I teach kids, so there is no problem about it because kids all kids want to speak all the time even when the when some kids tell me that teacher i don't speak english i don't care so <laughs> you have to you have to because this is english class okay you can do it come on so i always try to force them to at least tell me a sentence okay for example um on friday last friday class last friday's class they were hey, teacher teacher yes um puedo ir al baño english if you are not talking in english you don't exist so oh <laughs> okay 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 teacher teacher um um, um bathroom bathroom uh -huh, bathroom what what happens in the bathroom okay tell me so i always try to to that but even with that kind of problem the kids always Kids always is, uh, are thinking, okay, okay, I have to, I have to make a sentence because if I don't say the sentence, the teacher won't let me go, for example, to the bathroom. So I always try to force them, but there is no problem about it because kids want, always love to speak. So yeah, yeah, it's. It's uh, there's no problem in elementary, but in high school, for example, I teach French, and the problem is the same as Angie says. For for example, uh, we have to include because in English, well, I say I always tell them that okay, but English, you listen to music, you go to the movies, you uh, you are more exposed to this language, so you have to talk. But in French, okay, I, ha I, I have to admit that maybe you are not so um, exposed to French, but you have to because we are learning. So, okay, come on, you can do it. Come on, come on. And we have to do that because if I accept that, okay, he is not, uh, he, don't, he don't wants to talk in French, for example, or he's not reliable to that or so, I must to, no, I must. Qué francés y se me vino el francés a la mente. Dios mío, qué horror. Hoy no doy nada. Okay, I have to force them to speak. Yeah, I have to force them. So yeah, it, I think this case, uh, this uh, this case is, uh, depends on the age of the student. Age, right? Okay, okay. I like that. Yes, the age and the confidence. I, I, I like what you said is you have to force them. You have to. It's beautiful. And that, that's the only way, right? Forcing them. Um, and, you know, something that I, that I like to do, you know, just in case, so, sometimes I teach children and sometimes I teach, teach teenagers, sometimes adults. I, I like to tell them in the beginning of the class, I'm like, guys, you know, in, in this class, we, we are going to speak in English. And you're going to make mistakes, okay? Remember that none of us are perfect. That's why everybody is here because you're going to learn to speak and you're going to make mistakes. And if you don't make mistakes, you're never gonna learn. 
right? You're never going to grow. You're going to stay the same. Do you want to stay the same? I'll teach you. Okay, so make mistakes, okay? Okay, teach you. And then they, you know, give them a little bit of boost at the beginning of the class so, you know, and so, so they know that it's okay. But I, I am happy that you guys have nice groups where they, they like to speak. That, that's amazing. That's beautiful. I like that for you. Happy for you. <clears throat> okay, number two. I like asking my class to tell one another stories. They get so interested that they don't worry about the mistakes that they make. Do you guys make your students tell each other stories? Or not, not really. They tell me story. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, well, I think it's kind of uh, it's uh, like easier for me to uh, to make them speak because I have like the, the advanced level. They are with me, so uh, I have I have the. Uh, I have the students that actually speak English. So uh, sometimes uh, they want to show off. I have a lot of students that lo love to show off, especially in middle school. In high school, eh, not so much, okay? I don't have that many students, but eh, in middle school, eh, most of my students love to, to show off. And they're like, you know what happened to me, teacher? Uh, Yesterday, I found a kitty and, uh, and they are talking and talking and talking and talking. So, uh, and sometimes they don't, they don't care about the, the mistakes. They are so into the, the story and I'm like, really? And what happened? And I'm like, uh, uh, for, how can you say I'm, lo motivo, I'm motivating them to, to, to say more. They don't yeah, care. That's, nice. that's awesome. That's awesome. And you're the only one who teaches the advanced levels? Yes. Uh, teacher Angie is in basic. Uh -huh. Beginners and beginners in middle school and intermediate in high school. And Fern teacher Fernando is in beginners in middle school and intermediate in high school. And the one that is in a festival. Nice. Okay, okay. Well, telling stories is kind of more like for the advanced students, right? But um, let's see, let's move on to the next one. I can't do speaking activities in my class. The students make so much noise that the teachers in the other classes complain. Uh, was this a problem for any of you when you were in school? Or not? I think this is a problem that is very common now during online classes. Because, yeah, it's so much noise because, because the classes start and, okay, kids, good morning. Teacher, 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 teacher. Okay, yeah, okay. Teacher, have, I have a question. Teacher, I have a question. Okay, okay, come on, come on, please shut up and so it's kind of challenging to um to to in it's kind of challenging to give a a very effective class i think but life and during the normal way of a class I think at least with at least with me during during a class with the kids is the I need to I need the kids to make so much noise because if they are making noise they are having fun and if they are having fun they are learning so I think that is correct to make noise but during online classes I think it's kind of challenging to because they always speak in a lot. All the time. Yes, yes. That's true. That's true. And I like what you said about that. They're making noise, they're having fun. That's good. I prefer them to be noisy than to be quiet, right? Okay. Excellent. Well, um, this is it for the 
four skills and the sub skills. Um, did you guys receive the worksheets for this right here? Okay, Jocelyn hasn't printed out. Oh, you printed them out. Excellent. We're about to do some, we're not going to do everything on them. We're just going to make sure that we understood some important parts. Okay, let's begin with the types of skills and sub skills. Yes, describing language skills and sub skills. Okay, everybody you have worksheet one? Yes. Okay, so these right here are just some comments that teachers make. And, and you're going to discuss these with a group and decide whether you agree with them or not. Let's do the first one together. Teachers can help students read a text by reading it out loud while they follow in their books. Do you agree or disagree? Why or why not? Yay or nay, anybody, For Mr. Melgar. What do you say, sir? Could you repeat the question, please? Yes, right here. Teachers can help students read a text by reading it out loud while they follow in their books. Do you agree or disagree and why? I... I agree with that. Uh, in my opinion, I think it's a good idea uh, to guide them during the reading so they can be concentrated. Um, And they can get lost in the text because you are guiding them. Okay, okay. Nice, nice. So look, um, I, I agree. And I think we talked about this too, right? Where we can help our students. So in, in this case, when we read it for them or play the audio for them, it helps them understand it more. Um, so I'm gonna put you with a partner and I want you to discuss this. Remember, the question is, do you agree or disagree and why, okay? Now, you're only going to have 10 minutes to discuss this, okay? So try to go through it as fast as possible. 12.15, I'm bringing you back into the class, okay? And I'm gonna be entering to See what you guys are saying. Please enter the breakout room. And then what we have this one, we already discussed number one, there are no major differences between how we read in our mother tongue and how we read in a foreign language. I disagree, I disagree. The way that I speak in Spanish is different than the way that I speak in English. Yes, so it is completely yes. different, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a disagree too. You disagree too, okay? Yes, for okay. the same reason. Exactly, okay. To understand a reading text, you have to read and understand every word on it. I disagree. 
Yes. Sometimes you can get the general idea yeah. and that's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, when doing listening comprehension in class, I prefer to read the transcript to the students rather than use a recording. This way I can... They can make some notes about it. So mm -hmm. I, I agree too. I also agree. Okay. Let's go. Okay. Let's go to the next one. That is, um, there are no major differences between how we read in our mother tongue and how we read in a foreign language. Hmm. Uh, I, I disagree. Of course. Disagree because uh, remember that in English, the vowels have different sounds. For example, the A is may, you say call, you say uh, uh, at, for example. Yes, of so course. Yeah. I disagree with this. Of course. And in, in Spanish, for example, A is always A. A. Okay. A. It's, it's, it's the same. Yeah. Okay. So I also disagree. To understand a reading text, you have to read and understand every word in it. Oh, you have to catch the main idea. Yeah, of course. Uh, I'm not calling with this. I disagree. We don't, we don't have to, to understand every word in, in the test. We have to catch the, the main idea and let's join in the words we know. No, but I, I think that. <laughs> we referring to reading strategies mm, or grammar or how the text is structured it could be a difference no major but just a little difference what do you think miss okay okay the next Yes. And number three, to understand a uh, reading text, you have to read and understand every word in it. And that's why I always uh, tell to my students, okay, you don't have to understand all the words, okay, but you have to get the principal ideas, okay? You are not going yes. to, um, don't stop if you don't understand all. Yeah. You know, it's like they say sometimes in Spanish. Okay. And you, what do you think, or what do you do? In number three. Do you have a degree that you have to read and understand every every word? Or not? Not, no, not, not always. I think you mentioned it. Uh, sometimes we can get uh, we can understand uh, all the text just by just by checking or or understanding the the main idea. So it's not necessary to understand all the text. Okay, not as real, right? Okay, I'm not as real. In the next one, when doing listening comprehension in class, I prefer to read the transcript to students rather than using a recording. This way, I can speak slowly and pronounce words carefully. <clears throat> Uh, I don't agree with that because I think they um, sorry they they listen to uh like uh, like native accent and we have to or at lunch time I disagree. Uh huh. Yes, I don't think this. I think the students need to uh, participate and the students need to 
I mean, it says here that I don't think there is much value. I think there is a lot of value in speaking. Uh huh. Yes. yes. So I completely disagree with this. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes I don't and like, agree too. Don't like talking to other students because their English isn't very good, except for talking to the teacher. Uh, some students, uh, I don't know why, but some people are intimidated by me. And <laughs> sometimes, they, I mean, they are students that feel very comfortable uh, mm -hmm. talking to me. But others like kind are kind of embarrassed because they don't speak very well and they are afraid like uh, of making mistakes. So, uh, but, and they usually feel more comfortable uh, speaking with other people. And when I, I ask them, oh, teacher, you make me very nervous. No teacher. Uh -huh. So. Uh, it depends on the person. Yeah, it depends on the student. Yes, yeah, so like, I'm very undecisive on this, so I don't know. I'm gonna put agree and disagree because I have I agree. Both. No, it's, yeah. Well, he said students don't like talking to other students because. Mm, well, I well disagree. Um, mm -hmm. I like I said, it depends. Uh, yeah. Sometimes uh, I have students that aren't comfortable uh, with speaking with another classmate, and they prefer talking to me. Because they're like, oh no, eh, what if I make a mistake? You are going to be the one that notices my mistake. And they mm -hmm. like eh, they like me to, they like that I correct them, they like me to correct them. So, eh, and I have other students that are afraid of making mistakes so, and they don't like talking to me. So I have both. Both, yes. Mm -hmm. So it's only one page? Ah, uh, yes. Yes. So we are finished. Ingrid, excellent. That is fantastic. I only put. Yes, as well, too. I also uh, tried that uh, listening. Uh -huh. The words of the listening uh, have relationship with the vocabulary or with the grammar we are checking in that moment so that they can understand uh, well the listening. <clears throat> yeah, it's a practice all day, the info that we already get. So, and I never use yeah. the so, next one. Next one. Writing is more or less the same as speaking. I don't think there are any particular things to teach students. Oh, pretty good. Cool. Uh, I consider is oh, is almost the same because in both the activities are producing something, and if they have, I think if they have mistakes writing, they will have they will have them. Um, I don't think there are any particular things to teach students. I know that very much. There are a lot of things. Welcome back. Welcome back. <clears throat> All right, so I'm checking the time and, well, I think we should begin with the next topic. This one's a little bit faster. Um, this one is about different approaches to language teaching and which ones to use in your classes. Um, before we begin, uh, what approach in teaching do you use? You know what approaches is, right? I imagine. All of you are SEP teachers, so you should know this. What approach do you use in your classes? 
see you now. Mr. Morales, Mr. Guerrero. Yeah, I'm back. We are here. <laughs> Do you want me to show you the approaches? Maybe I like to refresh your memory. I use a, a, a mix of all these approaches. But the main approach I use is a communicative approach. And Grammar translation and sometimes that's must based learning. Excellent. Okay, guys. So um the the other the other approaches, I, I don't know it. I don't okay. know what is guided discovery, content based learning, and uh, that one content and language integrated learning. Uh, I haven't heard them. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to <clears throat> explain each approach and then I'm going to ask you the question again. What approaches do you use in your class? But Mr. Melgar, I like how you said that you use all of them, eh? that you use a mix. That's really good. Okay, so <clears throat> let's see. The first one. There are many different types of approaches to language teaching, some of which include presentation, practice, production, that is PPP, probably one of the most common approaches these days. Um, then we have task-based learning. Task-based learning is when you tell them to do something um, like, okay, guys, imagine that you are at McDonald's. One person is going to order the food and one person is going to take the order. Okay, do it. And it's like, whoa, whoa, you know, what am I even gonna say? You know, they're, they're right there, they do the task, you take notes of the mistakes and then you, you explain the mistakes to the students and then they do it again, okay? That is task where you learn. They do a task, check the mistakes, they do the task again, okay? It works good for, you know, students who need to travel, okay? They need to, they can role play hotels, they can role play restaurants, they can role play asking for directions, etc. Tell them to do something, let them do it, fix the mistakes, do it again. Uh, the lexical approach is when you teach um, with vocabulary. Okay, you teach words and chunks of words, and that is how your students learn language. The functional approach is when you begin the class with a purpose. Okay, today we're going to learn how to ask questions about vacation using the verb to be in the past. How was your vacation? Oh, it was fun, okay? Or today we're going to learn how to apologize. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, can you forgive me? My bad, okay, that's, that's function. You have a function, you have to, a reason for your learning. The communicative approach well, it says it in the same, the main purpose is to communicate, to write, to read, to listen, and to speak. You're focusing on the skills, okay? Not so much on the accuracy. All you care about is communication, okay? Fluency. Um, grammar translation, well, that one's easy, you know. You translate from Spanish to English, from English to Spanish, and that is how they learn. Um, guided discovery is when you give them like a listening or you give them a reading and you tell them, okay, guys, what are they talking about? Are they talking about the present, the past, or the future? And they 
discover it themselves. You don't say anything, okay? And then, it, okay, they're talking about the past. Very good. Are they talking about a specific time or just something in general about experiences? Wow, something general about experiences. All right, guys. And what vocabulary do they use? What grammar do they use? What words do you see? Oh, I see have. Oh, I see this verb. I think it's the past parts. Oh, exactly. So for that, that right there, my friends, is called the present perfect. And then you begin to explain it. Okay, so they kind of are teaching themselves in a way while you are guiding them, okay? Content-based learning is kind of similar to that. Um, you're teaching grammar and you're teaching vocabulary um, while, you're, while you're doing certain topics, like maybe you're talking about science um, or maybe you're talking about um, history and, and you're focusing on that content while learning grammar and while learning vocabulary, okay? It's all based on the content. This happens at, at bilingual schools in the beginning. Okay, they learn grammar while looking at their different subjects of the school. And it is kind of like content and language integrated learning. This is called PLIL. This is what happens in bilingual schools at an advanced level, okay? This is where they learn science, math, history, in the second language, but without focusing on grammar and without focusing on vocabulary. And in this part of their, of their learning, they already know English at a good level. So they're just acquiring more grammar, acquiring more language without really focusing on it. They're focusing more on the, on the subject. They're focusing on math, they're focusing on science and not on English anymore, but they are consuming English, okay? So which ones do you use in your classes? Mr. Melgar told me some of his, maybe Ingrid, Jocelyn, Mr. Guerrero, Mr. Morales. What do you use? PPP. PPP, Mr. Morales. Mm, me too. I used to, I used to use a communicative approach but with online classes it's like more it's a little bit more difficult so i only i the most common is ppp um maybe task based learning and grammar translation with elementaries nice yes grammar translation is good for beginner beginners right yes nice Ms. Angie, what do you use? Uh, oh, I like the same as PPP, but I like the very much task based on learning because we were, for example, when we are um, in a topic like um, interactions, I like them because I put them, um, I put them in, in teams or or then I show and I put a map on the screen. And we start out, okay, I mean, I'm here in the, I'm the doctor, how do I get to that? And they start telling me about that. And then I, I put them in things and one asks that, how to get to a place and the other answer and they, they, they have that interaction. And, and, I, and I use it very, very much. Nice, I like that, I like that. Mr. Guerrero? Well, I think I use the PPP in my classes. Presentation, presentation of the new words, or presentation of the new structure, then practice, and they have to produce according to this. And that's, that's the, the approach I, I use, the PPP. Nice, nice. Yes, that's the most common one, the, the yeah. modern one, yes. Definitely. And Ms. Delgado, how about you? PPP too. Yes. Okay, great, great. Yeah, this is one of the best ones. This is the one that helps our student build up the confidence because they see it in context. We we control we control some practice and then they they finally they can begin using it. It's a good confidence booster. All right, here we go. Ms. Velice, could you read this slide, please? 
Okay, approaches to language teaching. The second most common and modern approaches are the PPP approach and the skill-based approach. The PPP is great for beginner and intermediate students as it helps build up confidence by seeing, hearing the language in context. Then doing control practice with the language and finally producing it in speaking and brain activities. The skill-based approach is great for teaching skills. It involves getting the students interested in the topic related to the skill first, then teaching vocabulary, then seeing examples of the skill in context and finally using the skill. Yes, yes. Um, well, I, I think, Jocelyn, you told me that you, you use the skill-based approach from something that you told me earlier. You know, first you read the, like the one with the passion, you read about it as an example, you, get, you learn the vocabulary and then finally you begin to write, okay? That is skill-based approach right there. A great building up, no? Building yes. up. Yes. Exactly, exactly. This is great. All right. Here's the cool part. Okay. Mr. Morales, could you read this slide, please? All of them. Let's see. Maybe you can stop to right here. Okay. You are like a student, yeah. Yeah, I know. yeah, don't be lazy. Oh, come on, yeah, stop it. Okay, so um, uh, many languages teachers these days do not use one single approach. They may use one approach one week and a different approach the next. Or they may include on the approach practices typical of another. For example, you may see a teacher ask her students to do a drill on a common mistake in the middle of a communicative lesson. Yes, and like I mentioned earlier, a communicative lesson, it doesn't really focus on the accuracy. So it would be weird to correct your students' mistakes in a communicative lesson, but sometimes teachers do that and that is fine. Um, the mix and match approach is called an eclectic approach an approach which, which mixes techniques from different approaches. This is the technique that Mr. Fernando uses, right? Mr. Melgar. Um, the most important thing to remember is that different learners have different learning styles and different ideas about how language should be learned. So it may not be useful to only use one approach. Experience shows that what works in one teaching context may not work in another. All right, so you know, basically you have to experiment with all of the different approaches, all right? And see which one works best depending on the content and depending on your student, depending on a lot of things. Okay, let's see. We're going to do some of the worksheets for the language teaching. Can you open up the worksheet that says types of activities and tasks for language and skills development? Worksheet one? Mm, worksheet two, please. Let me pull it up for you. All right. So you probably know most of these words, but not all of them. Uh, we're going to eliminate the ones that we do know and then focus on the ones that we don't know. All right, we have guided writing, role play, problem solving, survey, brainstorming, etc. Let's begin with number one. <coughs> We're gonna do some of them together and then you're gonna do the rest on your own. Okay, number one, students find out information from others by asking questions or using questionnaires in order to practice speaking skills and or a specific language. Uh, what activity is this? 
survey. Survey, very good. The survey. Okay. Let's see. Let's go ahead and do number two together as well. Students repeat a phrase, sentence, rhyme, verse, poem, or song, usually with others, in a regular rhythm. What is this? Chant. Chant. Yes, sir. All right. Let's see what you come up with. Please finish this activity by yourself. You have four minutes. Let's see, what, what do you guys have for number three? Warmer. H, warmer, yes, sir. Number four? H. Four, H. Uh, number, number, eight. number three, H. Yes, number four? Jigsaw, listening, reading. Yes, K. okay. Jigsaw, listening, and reading. Number five? E, brainstorming. Brainstorming. Brain, brainstorm. Yes, brainstorming. Very good. Number six? Visualization. Yes, visualization. Visualization. Number seven? Guided A. writing. Guided. Guided writing. Excellent. Number eight? Role play. B? Number eight, B, role play, yes. Number nine? Rank or ordering, rank ordering. Yes, rank ordering or prioritizing. Mm -hmm. And 10? Problem solving. Problem solving. And 11? G. Jumble. Jumble text. text. Very good. All right. Now, these are just some um, little activities that you can do for working on different skills, right? Let's let's talk about this. Um, are these a are these comprehension or producting skills? Let me see. Let, let me put that in a in a little question over here. Question mark. Are productive. Okay. Are they comprehension activities or production activities? Um. Some some are different, like not all, not all of them are just one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's see. What do you think is the first one? Is it comprehension or production? Production. Production, the first one. What was that? Ah, no, 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 sorry. Uh, it's production. All right, very good. Production for the first one. Okay, okay. Number two, do you think it's production or comprehension? Comprehension. 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 Why, sir? Yeah. Production. They are uh, re repeating phrases, sentences. It's like uh, checking vocabulary, you know, but. Uh, it's just repeating. I don't think it, uh, I don't think this implies the students understanding what they are like repeating. It's just like yeah. this is production. But imagine if you put a a, um, a song on or things like that. I don't know. When they say it's production, okay, yeah, it's production because they are repeating. Yeah, it's clear for me. Yeah, production. <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> yeah, it is production because it's repetition, okay? Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Number three, what do you think it is? Production. Production, yes. Number four? Comprehension. Why? Because uh, number, what number four? Yeah, number four. Text. 
because they have to, uh, it says at the end, everyone knows all the information. Mm -hmm. All right, cool, cool. Uh, number five? Production. Production, very good, sir. All right, number six. Comprehension. Why? Because they are Asking. thinking, because they are thinking, they are figuring out. Yeah. It's very good. Very yeah. good, very good. Seven, what is seven? Produce production. production. Okay, nice, nice. Eight. Account. What did you say? Mm. Production. Why, why, Mr. Guerrero? Because they, they have to, they, 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 they usually, they usually work in pairs, uh, so maybe they, they asking and answering questions or uh, maybe doing a dialogue, I don't know. But that's production. It, it, it says the activity right there. They have to act out. It is production. Yes, they're acting. Definitely. Very good. Number nine. Comprehension. Why comprehension? Because they have to put things in order of they are, they are in discussion. Discussion? Negotiation. Negotiation. So you guys, where, where does the comprehension part come in? And I guess it's production. No, they tell me, to, I, I, I want you, because it could be both. I don't know. But I want to I know your opinions. Well, I think it's comprehension because there is discussion here. They are. Okay, yeah, man. Okay. But I, I mean, I, yeah. Uh, you. No, I said comprehension. I said comprehension, but I don't know because it says put a, they are, uh, they, you give them a list and they have to uh, think about the importance of the thing. So we have a, it's based on and they have to comprehend the what you have to understand the list i don't know if i don't know i i, I thought it was comprehension but is it production i don't know so confused. It's, for, it's production and, and production because they agree and disagree in something they they talk about the, this agreement or disagreements on something no Yes, the, the discussion, um, see, discussion doesn't mean like argue. It just means to yeah. talk. It just means to talk. So yes, production. Um, but if it was arguing, then definitely because you have to understand the other person's perspective. But what, what about 10? What do you have for 10? Uh, production. Yes. Because they are talking. Very good, very good. 11? Comprehension, I think. But why? Um, first, here, here's not saying that they are talking. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the key. That is the key. They are not talking here on this sentence. So this is comprehension. But uh, because uh, they are thinking in put the put the information in order. So they. So that's the production that you, about the topic that you coach. <laughs> you talk. Uh, come on, I give up. I give no, up. No, they have to put the thing in the correct order. I mean, it, it, it's comprehension. Yes. They have, you know, it's the thing that they know. They don't write that. It's comprehension? That's not complicated. Yes. Right. It's comprehension. Yeah. It's comprehension. Uh, okay. it, it's part of a, a reading skill, which is understanding different text styles. You know, you have to put them in the correct order. Very good, very good. Um, and now, that was, uh, I, I said that production because mostly our production. <laughs> yes. At the beginning. Well, look, now we know that they are production or comprehensive, 
but what skills are they working, okay? Uh, this is important because, you know, these are some good activities that we can do in our classes because, you know, sometimes we do activities, but we can do, you know, a little bit extra or, or add something new to our classes. So num number one, what skills are we using? Writing, speaking. reading, speaking. speaking. Well, I think. <laughs> yes, yes, it says it in the, the description. Okay, speaking right here. Number two. Speaking. Okay. Number three. Hey. I don't know. This, uh... Maybe. You said it was H, it's a warmer. It's speaking. Speaking. Uh, it's speaking now. Yes, yes. Speaking. Also speaking. All right. Number, you said number four is also speaking. Number four? Number four. Listening. And? Reading. Reading. And reading. reading. Yes. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah, very good. Number five. Uh, speaking. 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 Nice, nice. Six. Listening. Listening. Good, good. Seven. Writing. Writing. Okay. Nine. Uh, speaking. Oh, sorry, eight, eight, sorry, eight. Speaking. Speaking. Eight is speaking, yes. Number nine. Reading. Speaking. Number nine is. Reading. It's reading, you know? Because I mean, this one. They're giving a list. And reading too, because they are putting all the important. I think it's like both speaking. speaking and writing. Uh -huh. And writing. Reading. Oh. reading. Not reading, reading. Yes, yes, it's reading. reading. It's reading. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, read. Yeah. Uh, number 10. Speaking. Speaking. Okay. Speaking. All right. And 11. Reading. Reading. Okay, guys. So here you have it. You have different activities for the different skills. If you ever yeah. feel like you don't know what to do for a specific skill, here are some options that you can use for your classes. Okay? Yeah. Let's see. Let's finish this slide. Okay, I'm going to put you in groups of three so you can discuss this reflection right here. When, when you discuss this reflection, I want you to you know, give your opinion, talk about your experiences, share some tips, share some ideas, share your opinions, okay? Um, Mr. Melgar, Ingrid, and Justin together, Angie, Mr. Morales, and Andres together, okay? Um, let's see try try to only do this activity for six minutes okay i'm going to be checking in on you please enter the breakout room Uh -huh. I want to look at each of the approaches and think about what the advantages and disadvantages. I okay, I understand. So let's get started. 
Think about these comments from teachers. Which do you agree with and why? Okay, let's get started with number one. I want to look at each of the approaches and think about what the advantages and disadvantages are of each. Then I might try one out. So, what do you think about it? Out. I don't think that. What is it? So, do you agree with the first one? agree with this. It's really important to know the advantages and disadvantages. And you have to, for example, to try what could be the best for your kids because. Okay, number three, I suppose I use the same approach my English teacher used, but I'm not sure what approach that is. It doesn't really matter which approach you use. I think it matters. Obviously, it matters the approach you use because, as we were mentioning, uh, you need to identify the skills that your students have so that you can come up with different activities right. for them. Mm -hmm. So you need to you need to know the approaches. Yes, you need to know the approaches so that you can apply them correctly during class and. It's not that I use uh, something interesting. It's not that I use the same I approach my English teacher used, but there are like different, uh, how can I say this? I have like some of the attitude that my mm -hmm. teacher, my previous teachers had. I like, I, you could say I got inspired by them and some techniques, some, things I implement them in my class. And it's not only my teachers, my my fellow English teachers sometimes I I sometimes when I when I used to uh, uh, observe classes, mm -hmm. I could identify different techniques, different activities that my that my coworkers used to do and I imitated them. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Got inspired by that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. I think what about you guys? Yes, we can identify what what approach use other other partners or other teachers and we can use the these activities. I don't know. Mm. Let me see. Uh -huh. 
I think uh, it's important to know the approach we are using so that we can uh, choose the appropriate uh, strategies or activities according to the approach we we are using. Um, because if we don't know the approach we are using, we are, we're not going to know uh, what activities use. Uh, All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's reflect a little bit on what we have learned today. Uh, what is the first thing that we talked about today? <clears throat> oh, the skills. Skills. And the sub skills. Skills and the sub skills. Um, what is what, something that you think was really important to know? from this part of the workshop? Everything was important and it's important. Well, I think <laughs> everything is important. Well, yeah. what's one thing that you found interesting? About the skills thing? The part about the, the speaking that I don't necessarily have to correct every single uh, mistake. And this, that is something that I, that I personally have to work on, okay? Because sometimes I'm, well, when, when they are speaking, they say like two, three words and I'm correcting them. So I have to stop doing that. I don't have to do that. Just, maybe that's why they're afraid of me or something. I don't know. Nice, nice. Yes, trust me, it took me a long time too because, you know, I was conditioned to, to correct them like this, but it, it's really nice. It's really nice. Okay. Uh, something, something else that you found interesting, guys? Okay, I found very interesting the writing part. The writing part was very interesting for me and also the code that you show us was very interesting because um, I'm going to try not to be so rude with that. <laughs> so uh, I love that really. I, I found it very useful. So thank you about it. Okay. Writing and it looks better. It looks better me. not to put colors to correct instead of writing the cor the whole mistake. Yeah, it's, uh, it's so it's it's nicer. cooler colors. Definitely, it's cooler. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I am according with Mr. Morales that the code was very important, but I have, and I have now a question. What to do if the student, if the students uh, ask me, how, how, do we, how do I correct this word, teacher? I don't know how to correct the word. Okay, Can okay. That question. Uh, well, when my students ask me that, I, I like to give them references, you know? You know, if I know that that word is in a lesson that we just saw, like go look at lesson B and unit five, you will find that word there. And, and as I said, you know, try not to correct it for them, but if you have to, then do it. Like if you see that they're like really like about to pull their hair out of their head, you know, correct it. You know, you don't, you also don't want to stretch your student too much, you know, to where they don't, they get really frustrated with English and they don't want to talk to you anymore you know so you know th there's a there's a certain point where you actually do correct it for them okay but yes use references use references okay if it's possible guys do you have any questions for me no all right i i told this to teacher johnson and, and teacher uh, angie you guys are a great group Thank you so much for, for having me. Thank you so much for your participation. And well, it was a pleasure 
to work with you guys, okay? I'm glad that you found this interesting and yeah, found it important. That's, that means a lot. All right. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad to it's have you as a teacher too. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. I, I, love, I love to hear. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. It's motivation. Okay, guys. Well, uh, that is all for today. And um, maybe I will see you sometime in the future. But have a great Sunday. Okay. The and good luck you. with your exams. Thank you very much. Thank you. For you. Thank you. Yes, oh, we are thank going you. to need it. Thank you. We're going to need it. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye. 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 I'll, I'll, I'll send the video Bye. later. Okay. See you. Of course. Thank you. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.